Welcome to Resiliency Within. I'm your host, Elaine miller Karras. Um, also, I want to let you all know that if you want to listen and watch us on Facebook Live, we're at Resiliency Within. And today, my show is called Helping Children Navigate Uncertainty, Lessons from South Los Angeles. The U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy stated, mental health challenges in children, adolescents, and young adults are real and widespread. And even before the pandemic, an alarming number of young people struggled with feelings of helplessness, depression, and thoughts of suicide, and rates have increased over the past decade. The COVID-19 pandemic further altered their experiences at home, at school, and in their community, and the effect on the mental health has been devastating. So these are the words of the Surgeon General, and these last years have brought many challenges for students, teachers, parents, and guardians in a future filled with uncertainty. How can we best prepare our children? From the lens of education and community, my guest today, Adrian Acosta, will share what he has learned through the pandemic and how he feels we can best prepare our children in the future. Let me tell you a little bit about Adrian. I've come to know him. Um, we met right before the pandemic in February 2020. He had attended a community resiliency model teacher training that was hosted by LA County Mental Health. And I'm so grateful because since then, uh, he has helped us with many trainings, and he's one of our most wonderful facilitators of our teacher training um, program. But Adriana Costa's experience teaching special education in South Los, Los, South Los Angeles brought to light the need to build stronger connect connections between schools and communities. Adrian spent the past decade in Watts serving in a variety of community service positions. The lessons he learned throughout his journey led Adrian to establish the Ed Agency, he calls it TED-A, I love that, the, your acronym, an organization that is reimagining education for children who face barriers outside the classroom. TED-A's innovative approach includes, I love this, Ed Agents, and I want you to tell us more about what that is, who work directly with students and families to ensure they access the resources and support needed to succeed in school and maintain overall health and, and wellness. Um, in 2016, Adrian was selected, this is so impressive, Adrian, to join the UCLA Watts Leadership Institute, where he is now a fellow, peer mentor, and advisor. He's also a certified, I'm very proud to say, certified community resiliency model teacher. So today we're going to discuss how children's needs have shifted in an era where they have access to all the information in the world, but many lack the tools to know about what to do with it. He will also share how he uses the community resiliency model to help students manage new challenge, challenges and an uncertain future. Welcome, Adrian. I'm so happy that you're here with us today. Thank you, Elaine. Hello, everyone. And as we get started, my first question is just what's on your mind as you've heard all these things about you and I know what you're going to talk to us about today. Um, I don't think I've heard so much about myself in <laughs> such a short amount of time. So definitely overwhelming. Um, I think I have to go to uh, hoping I make my grandmother proud. Oh, that was my I'm... original thought. Yeah. <laughs> and what is your grandmother's name? So we know who we're talking about besides gra Adrian's grandma. So she was known as Mariquita. Mariquita. <laughs> it's so funny. I often talk about my grandma and we used to call her Abuelita Linda, the beautiful grandmother. And so uh, I think that they were also trying to get me to say Abuelita when I was little and I wasn't very good with Spanish at that point. Um, and I came out with Licky. So we called her Licky for her entire yeah. life. So I love that your grandma has a sweet name as well. So, yeah. okay, you're trying to make your grandma proud. Well, so Hopefully. let me let me go on to ask you my next question. So how has your lived experience inspired you to create the work you are passionate about in the world? Um, so I was born and raised in East Los Angeles. So I grew up in the 80s and 90s there and ultimately lived my life, went to college, studied psychology, and was fortunate enough to be placed in a school called Gompers Middle School in South Los Angeles. And a lot of that, uh, that event was really when everything kind of came together for me. So in our title of our episode is Lessons Learned from South LA. Even though I was born and raised in East LA, and that's still a huge part of me, um, it was really my time in South LA and Watts that has really shaped me and given me that purpose. Uh, and a lot of it was seeing myself and my students. It was my time at Gompers Middle School where I became aware of my challenges with depression, anxiety, and ADHD. 
um, and specifically those being things that impacted my education, but were never addressed. We're more so always addressed as a waste of potential. Um, I didn't take life seriously enough. You know, life was going to catch up to me at some point. Um, you know, all of those things. So Adrian, because I know you to be a very um, intelligent man. So I imagine you were also a very smart little boy. So I imagine that was a frustration because you had the intellect that you have, but you didn't have the assets of, I guess, teachers that understood how to work with you at that point. Was that your experience? I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm asking um, that correctly. Um, definitely. No, that was definitely the experience. And um, one of the things that did benefit me, and as we just discussed, like personas, I also struggle with authority. So there's some like oppositional defiance there. And my success in school came a lot from that because it was something for me to show my teachers that I could do it. So like dropping a test on their desk and knowing I aced it was satisfactory for me, even though I was going to get a C potentially in everything else or nothing because I would invest very little effort. Um, that was enough ultimately to guide me through academic success, but well, you know, opposition defiant. I guess I want to talk a little bit about that um, because sometimes when we become an advocate for ourselves, that doesn't mean that people around us know that what we're uh, being is being that advocate. They may look at it as being oppositional when we may look at life a little bit differently. Do you think that was part of that or not? I don't know. I think part, uh, a lot of what I try to focus on is truly never believing I am above anyone else. And that is something I really, really try to focus on. But in that same light, I don't believe anyone's above me either. So that's where, where the opposition defiant part comes in is if that's presented in front of me, it's almost like a challenge to me, like bet, like, let's see what you actually <laughs> like, okay. okay, so let me ask you this. When you talked to, when you said in the beginning, you want to make your grandma proud. Did you get some of this, um, this uh, intentionality in terms of standing up for yourself from your grandma? Is she that kind of person? So, yes. <laughs> so she was a very, very strong person. Part of um, the story with my grandma, there, she actually passed when I was seven. So I don't know much about her per from personal experience. The one personal experience I have, and this is kind of where a lot of just general social understandings just go way above my head. Um, but my grandmother... Um, had was passing away and was in the hospital and I had spent the day you know prepping for the funeral and my seven-year-old self came to see my grandmother and sat on her bed and let her know about the beautiful casket we had purchased for her oh my goodness um obviously to my mother's grief um she was not happy with uh what I was saying uh but my grandmother at the time uh just said leave him alone he's like sharing something that he wants to actually share with me. Like he doesn't see, you know, he doesn't know what's the bigger picture. And it was a moment where I actually was able to then make sure that my grandmother was buried with the cross that she wanted versus the one that we had purchased that day. Um, and that's one of the stories where like, I kind of remember where it's just like, I've always had a lot of trouble understanding like what I should say, what I should do in social settings, but remembering that probably my grandmother was one of the very, very few people who was like, that understood that I wasn't ill intentioned. I just didn't necessarily understand social norms all that well. And when you're a seven year old, I mean, not knowing if you've seen a beautiful casket and sharing that with her, but also I think that you were also listening to her in a way of knowing which cross to put in the casket. So um, I know that's also kind of a story of the little person that you were, that you were paying attention to her as well. Um, Another way to look at it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> of course. Totally, definitely. Yes. So, so I'm good. I want to, you know, kind of go a little bit further and ask about you obviously had the challenges with, you became a special ed teacher. Mm -hmm. Did you become a special ed teacher? Was that like an inspiration from not having the services that you needed as a kid? Or did that just happen in another way? Um. It really just uh, happened in another way. I got to be grateful for the partners I've had in my life that have helped me <laughs> get to places I've uh, reached. Um, I studied psychology and had kind of the intention of doing um, psychology for children and connecting with that. 
but I really was lost and still in a heavy depression when I graduated from college. So I really didn't know. Um, I applied for a teaching program and that's where I was placed in Gompers Middle School. And that's what I was like, okay, I really didn't feel a teacher reach me. And this kind of goes with the whole defiant nature. I feel I can do better than them. You know, and that was where the ego's like, at least I think I can do better than them. Um, and that's where the whole passion was. I saw that as hard as I try to get things to my students, whether it be like math or English, and that's why in full honesty, I was never very good at teaching English. I'm pretty good at teaching math. English just goes beyond me. But as much as I wanted to dedicate time and energy to that in making my lessons creative, if my kids didn't feel safe, if my kids were experiencing any other trauma or issues, it didn't matter. It really didn't matter at the end of the day because their basic needs weren't being met. And in the capacity that I had um, as an educator, even in special education, that was a really difficult field for me because it's very, it's very litigious. It's a lot about satisfying lawyers and making sure that districts don't get sued versus ensuring that we are giving the best to the child. And that was really hard for me uh, to deal with. And so after five years, <laughs> And yeah, they're quitting. Well, you end up quitting, but I, I also know that when you talk about your own depression, knowing that many, many children that are in special ed, like you said, are also, if they're facing with unsafe environments, that also can lead to having depression and anxiety. And we talked about that there is kind of an epidemic of that going on right now. So can I ask you before we get into more about what you've done with kids, being that you decided to quit your job after the five years, was there anything that helped you with the depression? Was there anything that helped you get through that? So my depression was between the ages of 12 and 27. Um, it was a decision at 25 that I needed to ultimately address the issue. Um, part of what was happening during my teaching um, era, and again, I've been fortunate to have people in my life. Uh, I would teach three periods of the day, skip off of campus during lunch to cry, dry my eyes for a period, come back to do fifth and sixth period, come back home, uh, change into like sweats and go to my neighbor's house so that um, I wasn't left alone because I was not sure that I was safe enough to be by myself during those times. Um, and a lot of that was where, you know, having neighbors at the time that, you know, were also familiar with depression in their families understanding that my situation that I was dealing with was very difficult and what I was seeing in education, but there was much deeper, you know, things that ultimately that I was carrying that um, didn't necessarily have anything to do with situations, but also like biology and genetics. And so I know you've become quite an advocate of the community resiliency model, knowing that we're based on neuroscience and we do talk about the biology. Um, but I also know that you're very dedicated to creating a different paradigm Kind of a, it's kind of a, on a continuum of what I'm asking you really is that with your nonprofit, you want to not have children have to wait till they're 25 or 27 to get help. That's a long time in that 12 to 27 year period. So I would really be interested in your ideas because I think this is a time in our, in our communities in the United States and on the globe to maybe look at this issue of safety that you're talking about in trauma. So I am giving it back to you and say, you get to talk about whatever, because I know this is your jam, Adrian. So <laughs> how do you see us changing things? What are you doing um, to change things? Okay, so I can share definitely what I'm doing to try to change things. Um, we're really, again, going back to that connection to Gompers and seeing how my students challenge to access education when there were so many other issues happening. And then my work in the community and specifically Watts and seeing amazing people, seeing amazing children, seeing them put in the work, like to actually like make the difference. Um, that's where at for me, it was really, I need to try to bridge the gap between education and community. Um, the community has to have a lot more agency around what is happening in education so that we can reach the children that are really struggling the most. Um, because unfortunately, the children that need us the most may not make it to a campus, may not make it to that school. And unless 
education and people are within the community to be able to hopefully identify um, those families and those children that need this um, extra support um, because very much as a village, really trying to bring that. So that's where like, I love the community resiliency model because it's a really easy way to communicate the importance of wellness and the understanding that our bodies are human and we're designed for survival. We're not necessarily designed for happiness. So understanding that when we're placed in an area, in a situation where we must just survive, we're not really living, we're just surviving. And that's where, you know, going to hopefully back to kids, what I really want to focus on is much more of the prevention piece of really working with them when they're younger and helping them hopefully prevent or heal from their trauma when they're younger and understand the importance of that so that they don't, like I said, get to... 25 and 26 and are in complete desperation because they're seeing their own timeline ending soon. Um, yes. And it, <laughs> so what are you doing specifically? I know that you talk about in your, the organization, there's a mentorship program. Yes. Um, and I just recently got an email from a, a person who realized that we knew each other and said, Oh, the dots are connecting and said some wonderful things about her son being in the mentorship program and how learning the skills of the community resiliency model have meant so much to both of them. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, yes, you definitely got me in my feels by mentioning <laughs> that one again. Um, yes, so the idea is really, I don't necessarily like the term mentor or even leader because I, for one, don't feel I'm the one to determine that. Um, so the I'm the student's ed agent. So the concept behind that is I am referred to them by their parents, um, but it is my responsibility to work directly for the child to address their health, happiness, and education in that order. Um, Can you say health, happiness, and, and education. education? Okay, so education is part of the three, but it's not the very first one. The health is number one. Okay, mm -hmm. it's the third, um, and really understanding there's a lot of like health components, you know. Um, we're dealing with a lot of different issues as we've discussed, kind of like climate change, needing to pay attention to the water our kids drink, the air they breathe, addressing things like that. The happiness is really the mental health component of understanding that that needs to be really part of us. And what I've realized in working with the kids in those two capacities, they don't need me on the education piece as much. Um, and that's really been the huge component and eye-opening thing to me because it's still the ed agent over the idea of the education agent but in working directly for them and them dictating what they need from me because I work directly for them it really doesn't get to the education part I hear more from their parents about their education improving and things like that than them themselves necessarily sharing it with so me. So can you connect the dots for us? How does it, as you, as you are this, the agent and you're helping them with their health and happiness, what specifically are you doing in those avenues that are also changing than the way that they are interfacing with the educational system? The biggest thing, and I'll share what they told me, the difference is I was listening. And that seemed to be something that they weren't getting necessarily over the pandemic is a lot of adults uh, talking. And that's where the pandemic really opened up a lot of the need for that, because my kids were able to learn so much information from the Internet. Like it, it was my fourth grader that taught me about NFTs. So like there's things like and these different concepts that they have access to and can learn. They have all the information. They just don't necessarily know what to do with it. And if I can help them be their best selves by addressing the health and happiness component, I'm finding that the kids are very well equipped with being able to process a lot. And as we're discussing um, the future and uncertainty, just as like the pandemic became was really uncertain and really shook our, uh, in my opinion, really shook the education system. And I and sh identified a lot of areas where we can really improve. Um, really understanding that that might be a norm now where school systems and systems may be continuously interrupted. So what necessarily are we going to do to prepare our kids for a future that is somewhat unpredictable? 
And you know, what's so interesting about this is that we just recently had a really terrible windstorm, the worst I've ever experienced in the part of Los Angeles where I live. And I think the winds were 60 to 80 miles an hour. It was really, we have trees all over our community that have fallen down. We lost power, power is still not back in some of the areas. And they did have to uh, close school today because of, so we can say, did this happen just because of this, this nature or did this ha happen because of climate change? But wh whatever the, the answer is, is that children are still being interrupted in school. So what you're saying is that you have a prediction that this could happen with more frequency. And then how are we preparing kids for those kind of interruptions? So, yes. and so can you talk a little bit more of the how to prepare? Because I think we're all looking, okay, so what do we do then? So when you talk about helping to, you know, to listening to children, you know, how do we cultivate that capacity to listen? I mean, here you're starting a nonprofit. Are you, treat, are you training other people to be agents that can work with children as well? Tell us a little bit more about what your plans are. Um, so I love that you led it in that, that direction. Um, I am starting a nonprofit because I want to use my privileges to hopefully create some sort of structure where others can do what they do naturally in a sustainable way. Um, so a lot of where my goal is very much finding the ability to create an organization that can employ community residents that are working a lot of where um, one of the things that is a huge concern for me is like daycare. If we're really going to be about caring for children, what about, you know, our babies and really being able to then connect, you know, community members and really understanding. And that was one thing that really was reflection over this past week that I am not going to do anything. Um, I am going to be one piece of a larger team that is ultimately going to do good things. Um, and I'm just trying to use my mind that never stops to try to <laughs> plug in any holes that I can um, and hopefully uh, create a structure where we're in the community, community members have an ability to be uh, sustainably employed, but are you know able to be in the community doing what they do best and working with children that may need intervention, need extra support, uh, and us as a village, hopefully supporting each other. And, and that's why I, I do want to mention, I am not doing this like the community of south la and watts is doing this like i want to hopefully in them um kind of adopting me i kind of want to just join up and hopefully help with my own mind create my little piece of hopefully a structure that can help us grow well i think that might be something to do a little segue about south los angeles and watts because sometimes people may not think about all the well-being and the resiliency factors in the and the amount of social activism, working with social justice, for example, in that part of Los Angeles. Would you like to talk a little bit about that? Because you've been so intimately involved in being part of the community. So I love South LA and especially like Watts. I do talk a lot of, because it really was where I saw so much beauty and wealth. And that's where it really changes the idea of wealth in Los Angeles and being so close to Hollywood and seeing all this glitz and glamour. But, you know, it was being an East LA kid and living a similar lifestyle, but then coming back like to South LA and seeing children that reminded me of myself, but seeing community members doing everything they can to make kids' lives better and using every resource possible. Um, but understanding that the system, just as like the school system I was, as much as I tried within that system, I was not giving the kids what they deserved. Um, and that's where it's really coming back of, it's been working with the community, learning from the community and how I can ultimately fulfill that, that commitment I gave when I first entered the community of that I was going to help support the children. And I'm still trying to do that. Well, and, and as you're talking about this too, Adrian, I can see that that it, it was when you decided to leave the, the middle school after five years, um, was that an easy decision? I'm just curious, was that easy or it wasn't an easy decision? I mean, because I can, I can just hear the commitment and the passion in your voice about wanting to help the kids. And sometimes I know in my own life, I had a certain idea of how I could do that. And then sometimes I realized that I couldn't do it in the way that I thought. And sometimes that change of plan caused a bit of suffering. And yet 
that bit of suffering also led to something that was actually better um, in terms of advocacy and maybe even change. I don't know. Does that ring true for you as well or not? Um, very much so. What it, what it was really is that I wasn't going to be able to change the system while working within it. And that's where I really feel like I had to step out of that system and see everything else that was happening around me um, to see how that can be grown and cultivated um, because I just wasn't able to change the system within. And I, I think it's important that our listeners, you know, maybe if they're um, facing a similar challenge, because sometimes systems were created long before any of us were ever born <laughs> and they have certain ways of doing things that may not lend well to innovation. That certainly has been my experience in bringing the community resiliency model and the trauma resiliency model into kind of a larger world stage. And that doesn't mean that we don't continue to try, but it doesn't come without suffering. So I'm hoping that maybe we can talk a little bit when we come back from the break, um, again, about some of the lumber. I know that you're using the community resiliency model. I'd love to hear more about that and why you think that's important. And also just hear a little bit if there have been challenges. It's always good to know what those challenges might be if someone's thinking, well, I can do that in my community. So let me know what those challenges are, Adrian. So maybe I won't, I won't have to have the same ones, but maybe they're inherent in the system. You know, who knows? But I certainly um, want you to continue that conversation. So um, for our listeners, we will be back in just a few moments with Adrian Acosta, who will continue to tell us about this very innovative uh, organization he's starting and how we can start to help children in community with cultivating health and happiness that leads to them having better experiences with the educational system, because ultimately it's about safety, isn't it? And also I wanna talk a little bit more about how do we cultivate safety when sometimes the world around is not so safe. And I think that many of our kids are experiencing that all over, not just on the South LA, but in other parts of this US and, and the world. All right, we'll be back in just a few moments and continuing our conversation with Adrian Acosta. This is Elaine miller Karras, and I'm here with Adrian Acosta. Welcome back. We're gonna continue our conversation about the nonprofit that he started and also Adrian's perspectives of how we can help children um, experience greater senses of safety, which is so important for them to be able to feel, I'm gonna use the word safer, Adrian, in order for them to be able to be calm enough to have their prefrontal cortex available to them so they can listen. So can you tell us a little bit about how you're operationalizing, let's say the community resiliency model, why you think it's important for the work that you're doing and other things that you've integrated into the work that you're doing? Um, great, so, and so there's two main components with that really is integrating the community resiliency model in my work as an ed agent. So very much helping listening to my students, helping them better understand their bodies, their nervous systems, really helping them understand when they're going to make those decisions that may cause consequences that they don't want to deal with later. And, you know, and helping them learn different strategies and the different skills that will really help them be their best selves and hopefully not necessarily rise up and hit those peaks that I would always hit. And even before, um, as we mentioned, I didn't receive this training until February, 2020. So a lot of that has been, as you mentioned, learning myself and what, how it applies to myself. So another component of that has been providing community resiliency model trainings for community organizations, uh, community members, teachers, anyone who ultimately is ready with the understanding that the better everyone is at being at themselves and being prepared for life, the better we're going to be able to show up for our kids and really be able to be our best selves so that we can then help them. But if we're experiencing all the trauma, it is going to be very hard for us to also be there for our kids. And I've definitely gained a much bigger understanding with that through community resiliency model. And one of the big things I feel that in this scope, especially in the community work, is the idea of forgiveness of oneself for not being perfect. And so how has, um, how, how have you come up, forgiveness is hard. So how have you learned about actualizing forgiveness for yourself? And, and then how do you 
teach children about that? It's really understanding that I'm not perfect and understanding that I'm designed to survive. So that goes back to even looking at my depression and being, I was academically successful, but as a student, I was terrible. Like I would, you know, I would get kicked out of class. Teachers did not like me, um, but I was surviving. One of the big things that came out of the training, and I know you know this, was yeah. my the, all the issues I had with feeling I had to sit still and could not move my body. Um, in your training, when, when you gave me permission to literally move was the first time in my entire life I had ever been given that permission to move. And, you know, since then, I've realized like how many times I internalized actual trauma of feeling that I was broken as a kid for not being able to sit still. Like everybody else seems to be able to do this simple task, you know, this simple task. I can't. Why can't I? Um, and ultimately then gaining that understanding that we're all individuals and we're all different. And I am different in the sense that I ground by moving. And that's something important. And a lot of that is like that forgiveness. So really working with kids of like when they make a mistake, maybe they had a huge blow up at school and they ended up getting in trouble. Not in the sense, and that's why like what's the beauty of it is I'm the ed agency. And I know that's where it becomes more complicated with like the parents because the parent may have other responsibilities that they feel they might. I don't have any disciplinary responsibilities. I work for the child. So I just get to ultimately listen and figure out, okay, how can we prevent this from happening next time? Because you're not enjoying the consequences. You know, maybe they got grounded, maybe they lost their phone. How can we do that? And that's where it's been really refreshing and a positive relationship with the parents as well, because it's a team thing. We're working together. You know, the parent or guardian does the parent and gardening part. I'm the ed agent. I'm just that support and that link for education to support that child. And it, it really is that together, um, we get to kind of make this happen. Help. Well, you know, yeah. as you're talking, you know, I'm really, I mean, I think this is the reason why, of course, I've been uh, bringing the community resiliency model to the world as much as I have is that this biological aspect is something that gives us a paradigm. It gives us a window to look at behaviors that have been inexplicable to us. So like in your case, you needed to pace or you needed to move your leg. And when that leg moved, actually it helped you stay calmer so that you could pay attention. But if the teacher or someone else says, stop moving your leg, no, you can't get up and pace against, you know, across the room, um, you're going to disturb everyone else. Then of course, what do we do? We swallow shame and we, sh we swallow the idea that there's something wrong with us. Not that our nervous system is releasing and discharging what it needs to discharge so that we can stay in a calmer space. And that's the kind of information that's so important for children to know. And as you said, our survival responses. If we're growing up in a part of the country, the world, where we're under threat by either our family, the neighborhood, the community. There's drive-by shootings. There's um, people that treat us differently because of the color of our skin, because we, because we, our family speaks Spanish, whatever it might be, then that can be a threatening environment out there. So how do we create those little pockets of feeling safer that I matter? And when I'm hearing from you, um, Adrian, and I've seen you work with people, and I know this is how, what's in your heart, is that you, you let people know that they matter. Isn't that the underlying thing? They matter to you. I, I hope that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I hope. I know that I've seen you do this, but that hope also is giving them a new understanding, like you've gotten that understanding from not only the community resiliency model, but from other factors in your life about it doesn't have to be the way that you've experienced it. It's like taking, you know, it's like those, those um, old adages, you know, you took lemons and made lemonade. I mean, I still love that, even though I know it's kind of corny, but that's what you've done. I mean, you could have, because there are some people that have the experiences that you have. And sadly, you know, when we hear what the Surgeon General said just in December of 2021, that if we can't help children in this way, we could lose a generation of children. We haven't faced a pandemic for a hundred years or more. And now we have the pandemic on top of everything else like climate change, like social unrest, et cetera. And how does that impact children? 
So how do you, I'm going to ask you another question that I know we didn't plan, but how do you see us scaling this kind of program? Like, what are you doing specifically, specifically, like, did you go back to your old school district? Are you talking to administrators? How are people knowing that you're out there in the world as agents for children um, and also collaborating with parents, I imagine, and educators at time in order to help that child become the best person that he, that he or she or they can be? So the work with schools has definitely come in much more recently with schools really looking to find ways to support their teachers because the edu educators are really struggling right now and have too much to deal with. Um, so really um, bringing that in. In that light, also understanding that that is a field that has been losing a lot of amazing people yeah. yearly and especially with the pandemic. Um, so a lot of what I, as I mentioned, what I'm hoping to create is a setting where educators and people who are dedicated to children can do exactly that in the, in the space of, you know, working on their health, happiness, and education, because that's a lot of what teachers do that no one ever gives them credit for. They think this just about, you know, math or has, you know, the test. We've unfortunately given so much responsibility to our teachers, um, and some of them do it quite well. But being able to bring them to a space where they can focus on their expertise and really being able and provide resources around um, the community. So another component of the agency is collaboration and really working with other, other agencies and understanding that I alone am not going to do anything, really. It's those partnerships of being able to, okay, if I have this resource, I have this student I know this connection, maybe they can do this because they do this service very well. How can we all work together as a community? And that's how I've, how I see it scaling of really being able to work and identify each other as leaders in our own fields, in our, each in our own expertise and really being able to maximize that. Because as I mentioned, there's a lot of genius in the community. Uh, what's missing is a lot of the infrastructure or resources to really make those connections happening, happening. That's and that's what you're trying to do is to make those connections. Well, I'm also, I'm going to ask, ask you another question is that, you know, in terms of you kind of not liking authority. Um, and so here there are different places where the authorities come down on you and said, well, I don't know if I'm going to do that or not. And now I hear what you're talking about. Oh, you're a collaborator. You are working with probably the authority figures that you may have had challenges with, knowing that you can maybe collaborate with them that might have a different outcome. So I don't know if that's even true, what I just said, but can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that we do have to get to the point that not everybody is our adversary and that we see where we can come together with collaboration. So, you know, for those people out there that are thinking, I know exactly what he means about the authority figures. So how did you... What happened? What was the transition for you to start collaborating? Let's put it that way. I'll honestly say it's still something I struggle with. <laughs> that's, that's, um, that's, that's fair. That's fair, Adrian. Go ahead. It's one of those, again, one of those uh, things of just who I am. I can be very um, aggressive sorts of certain things. What has really, what it has really come down to, and again, what it come, my message is I, I'm not a betting man, but in the say of like, if I, what I have with my life, I'm hoping to just put all that for kids. Like that's, that's where I'm putting all my chips, hopefully, is yes. on kids. And that has been my unifier, is working within the community. Does it matter, you know, where the fact that I even, I came from East LA, but South LA and Watts is, you know, welcomed me and they've, you know, accepted me. I'm going to be there as, as long as they don't kick me out. And they know that. I tell them that all the time. It's like, <laughs> I'm hopefully here until you kick me out. Um, but yes, trying to really bring that all together. Well, and when I, when I hear that, you know, in terms of you being a fellow with that UCLA program, they had to see you as a collaborator in order to even offer that to you, wouldn't you say? Yes. yes. And one of, one of the biggest, biggest honors about that, and which I really take seriously, is I've was not born in the community. Uh, I've been in the community since 2005, but it, 
I wasn't born there and it was actually two members of the community who referred me to the program. Um, and that's meant a lot to me in which I really feel I have to honor that. And that's where I go back to the constant thing of when I discuss the ed agency and uh, ta-da, the way I shorten it, ta-da. Um, <laughs> ta-da, <laughs> I love that. Really being open about the idea that it in itself is not going to do anything. It's not going to be the organization that uh, saves the community. And that's one thing that I've really, that hurts me, honestly, which I, I do feel that a lot of, you know, politicians, organizations, different agencies of different sorts come in and make a difference somewhere and want to take credit for that difference. And I'm, hope, I'm hoping that I can communicate that that's not the reality. Um, that's never been the reality is any of the work I've done in the community. It's always been with the assistance of community members and family members that dedicate 24 hours there. And it's just me trying to fit in and help where I can. Um, so that's where it's, it's really that understanding. And as it, you know, we were mentioning as far as uh, I mentioned, like receiving a text from a parent and understanding that leadership oftentimes gets taken over by patriarchal hierarchy and understanding that what privileges I have, you know, even like the privilege to take the risk to start a nonprofit during these times is a privilege I can't ignore, but how can I use those to then really dedicate time and bring the resources of those who are really doing the work. And like one of those things is like healthcare. I work in the fields, both fields I work with in education and community are predominantly dominated by women. And we claim to care about kids and stuff, but where's the support for mothers and guardians and things like that? And that's why for me, it really has to come all together as I'm scaling the ed agency, because I don't, I, I don't want to offer like small positions just to, so people can hopefully support my dream. It's really about hopefully trying to create a team that can then support our dream, uh, but it's sustainable where they're not making the sacrifices because that's a privilege I have. Well, and I think when you know, you're talking about children and you're talking about their parents or their garden, guardians and um, is that most cultures that I've been to, I mean, all the cultures I've been to, that there is such a value in protecting children. And sometimes when children can't be protected is because the situations become so dire that people don't know how to protect the children or the children become vehicles that the adults use in order to um, sustain a system that's kind of broken. And so what I'm hearing you say though, is that you really are trying to get, engage the community with cultural humility. And even coming from a part of Los Angeles, okay, East Los Angeles to South LA, is that still there's different cultures that exist in all of our communities within Los Angeles. I'm sure our listeners who come from many places across the globe, you know your own culture. And so having to adapt and come through and try to do that deep listen can help, I think, us collaborate so that the goals become the shared goals. You may have the idea and the vision, but without the, the collaboration of the ideas of the community, then it does just fizzle away. It has to have meaning um, for it to sustain and to, to scale, I think, for the community. I don't know if that makes sense what I'm saying to you in terms of your philosophy. Um, no, yes, very, very much something. Um, and something that just popped into my mind and it's kind of going different direction from yes, what you ahead. were just saying. Uh -huh. But uh, one of the things that has, I think, kind of made me, or one of the things that people tell me that has made me different is how open I am with my issues with depression, anxiety, and all that, and how much that has been part of my life. That has been extremely important for children to hear. Extremely important for children to hear. Because, and that was that whole thing as much as they communicate via social media and things like that those are all highlighting a lot of the positives those are highlighting images that we even as adults tell them they should kind of you know be feeling or thinking um but a lot of them are secretly suffering as you were mentioning and having the discussion as adults that we're not perfect that we make mistakes that we're still growing has been very, very beneficial for, I feel, my kids to hear. Because 
that's one of the things that they told me over the pandemic of what, why they were even willing to talk to me, you know, because it's voluntary. They can fire me whenever they want. Um, you know, the service with them is free. There's no, uh, they There's can no fire cost. Me. There's no cost. Oh my goodness. Uh, well, okay. so in South LA, so my work in South LA, as I mentioned, that's, I'm just trying to contribute what has kind of been given to me where I have been able to raise more funds is work outside. So that's where this year and over the pandemic, especially hearing from other organizations that want to learn more about the community resiliency model, organizations that want to learn more about uh, integrating honest conversation about mental health into education. Uh, that's when I use those resources to hopefully to fund my work within um, South LA. But there's that's where the scalability um, comes into play. And that's where I, again, where I welcome other team members because I've realized I don't necessarily like all that stuff. <laughs> I can do it, but I don't like it. <laughs> well, I think that, you know, being a good leader, okay, I'm going to use the word. Sometimes being a good leader is also to know where we need help in terms of what we can't provide, but what someone else can provide. So I don't know, I'm going to use that, that term. And I'm, to me, you know, that there's different terms of leadership. I mean, le there's collaborative leadership where there's an equanimity in how ideas and thoughts are brought forward. So I guess I'm going to say that about what I'm hearing you say, Adrian. But I also want to kind of get back to this. I mean, I really do appreciate, and I've seen you do this in our CRIM teacher trainings, that you do have a, a, an amazing humility about talking about your depression and talking about the things that help you. And I know for me, when I hear you say that, I always think, oh, there's someone in the, in the group that's going to really appreciate that. And we do hear from people that your honesty and your transparency is very helpful. But I think that's also part of some of the ideas, you know, we could think about it's, such, it's in some ways it's kind of simple that so much about depression and also mental health conditions have been in the closet that, you know, oh, well, if I'm a strong person, I can't do that. Let's talk what you said about being perfect. Well, um, perfection, I don't, if you t show me a perfect person and I will say, well, maybe they're not alive anymore because I think part of being human is being imperfect. Um, but I think that's a, another piece to this that is important. And I hope that our listeners, if any of you are suffering from depression or anxiety, to know that there's help available. And that, I mean, you're a, a great example of that. Not only have you taken this, but you share it with others. And I'm going to ask you a question about that. When you share that you have been depressed in your life, does that help you stay within that window of, of not sometimes sliding back into depression, that you're not alone in that expression? Yes. In the sense that also depression is the only thing I fear in life. And that's why like people discuss like a fear of death and that that does the only thing I fear in life is going falling back into a depression. Um, with that said, I, I, I forgot my point with that, but uh, well, it sounds oh. like you have some safeguards now. I know mm -hmm. you have the community resiliency model, but you also are not alone because you've spoken it to people. Yes. And, and now I remember my point. A lot of it too is flipping the script on it. So very much my depression is viewed as a terrible thing or what is it made me who I am and I like who I am now and it's also recognizing that a lot of the empathy I have for others comes specifically from my depression yeah. my my hyper awareness of situations and being prepared comes from my anxiety my mind that doesn't stop producing things comes from my ADHD so these ideas that these disabilities are things that need to be hidden and shunned, um, the way I'm kind of viewing life is since I wasn't able to figure it out before and social norms were going over my head anyway, now I'm kind of fully embracing the life of, well, I just <laughs> got to do me because I like who I am. And that's a lot of where my message too with kids is there's a lot of beauty in the differences we each bring to the table. Um, and hopefully by sharing some of my awkward ones and things like that, kids can see that it, we're all a work in progress. Adrian, you have been a pleasure to interview today. We're almost ready to end our show. And I, I, I want people to know how to get in touch with you. If they're out there saying, I want to know more about this today. And I don't, I want to know about agents and maybe we can create this in our community, or maybe they can become an agent alongside with you. How do they get in touch with you? Um, so I can re be reached at acosta at weartada.org. That would be A-C-O-S-T-A -A at 
W E A R E T E D A dot org. And the website for um, the ed agency is we are to da dot org. So can you, we are, that's Ted A dot org. So yeah, T E D A. Okay, just in case they didn't know what Tada meant. Yes. Okay. Well, and I just want to say, you know, as we're getting, as we're ready to leave, often on our show, we talk about what else is true. And Adrian, you certainly are about what else is true. Not only are you cultivating um, health, um, I imagine you have many smiles on these kids when you help them understand about their biology and about how they are, as you say, these unique individuals that have so much to share. And I'm certainly glad that I've come across you in my life. I'm very grateful for February 2020, right before we all shut down that you're kind of the last training I did in Los Angeles in person. And uh, I'm so glad that you're part of our organization. So thank you so much. And for all of our listeners that may be suffering, remember that there is help available. You could always go to our sponsor, traumaresourceinstitute.com website that can also connect you to a, a, one of our CRIM workshops or, or to a, a therapist if you think that's something that would be helpful for you. So until we meet again, remember what else is true in your life and stop and kind of just look around you and see maybe one thing that can bring you jo joy or uplifts you. And maybe for me today, it's Adrian Acosta as I'm seeing and hearing about his life. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Signing off. All clear. Thank Great you. Great job today, everyone. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much. Yep. Take Thanks. care. We'll see you next time. Okay. Thank you.